it gives me immense pleasure to welcome dr siri venkat madhu as the consultant speaker of this session taaliyan bajai dijiye madhu you can come to the stage and occupy your chair his md in medicine initially trained as a who fellow at jocelyn dabadi center and cleveland clinic usa later at am aims new delhi where he did dma endocrinology and metabolism which is a post doctoral physiology medical course leading endocrinologist of india currently occupying the position of director professor department of endocrinology center for endocrinology diabetes and metabolism at university college of medical sciences and guru tegh bahadur hospital delhi he shall speak on i am repeating redefining wellness spotlight on weight awareness and action in short his medical journey can be divided with three phases academic achievements medical teacher for 37 years actively involved in diabetes research and care for last 34 years editor in chief international journal of diabetes of developing countries editor in chief india journal of endocrinology and metabolism research contribution over 300 national and international publications in diabetes and other related areas of medicine over 25 chapters in books awards and honors notable awards are around several few of them being world india diabetes foundation usa india outstanding achievement award 2023 in recognition of remarkable scientific accomplishment and innovative approaches awarded outstanding service to endocrinology award at 6th international diabetes and endocrinal endocrine conference in kambatur presented by chair of the international society of endocrinology dr ashwini first i need to congratulate dr ashwini for having conceived and conceptualized such an important public health event in the form of dialogues in wellness and health and through this um, series of last 14 um, which is already mentioned over the last two years and i had the good fortune of coming in 21 regarding prevention of diabetes i think it sends a positive message of health and wellness creates awareness among the public and it has served not only the general public but also the staff of the iic who have benefited quite a bit from specialist um, concerns in a way and um, specialist opinions at their doorstep i thank dr ashwini for inviting me again to 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 share my views on weight and obesity and i thank iic for the opportunity there were people who suggested that it's a it's an awareness on obesity the word to use the word obesity but deliberately it's mentioned weight because we don't want to as ashwini said before we don't want to focus on motapa we want to focus on weight we need to understand how we regulate our weight how do we maintain a healthy weight that's the focus and anything that is not a healthy weight becomes unhealthy and obesity is one of such states so therefore the focus is on weight and and what we'll probably do in the next half an hour is awareness about how what regulates our weight how can we maintain a healthy weight and what actions we need to do to remain healthy and if we are already obese how do we need to cut down uh, our weight and get it back to normal that's going to be the overall focus initially i'll give you some figures partly to frighten you but but not really to scare you so just to just to for you to understand how serious this problem is it's much beyond the cosmetic issue Uh, although we all uh, are aware that it is it's equally cosmetic but there are several health issues involved in this and we need to understand that after that we'll get into a conversation mode where i'll be you know posing some questions say, to myself and then answering it uh, on your behalf and wherever you don't understand you may please note down and we can have a question and answer session after we finish we'll also clear some misconceptions some of the myths that we have regarding uh, weight control obesity and so on and at the end of uh, my talk to be open for discussion for all of you so with that introduction let me get to the 
topic of weight awareness in. So these were the figures or these were this was the problem. First we need to understand the problem. You see, unless we know that it is a health problem, we will not be become aware enough to take measures to control uh, any excess weight that we may have. Overweight and obesity are some of the biggest challenges we are faced with today. Obesity contributes significantly both to morbidity, which means illness, and mortality. And the mortality increases directly to the degree of excess in weight. So the greater your obesity, the more you are at risk of adverse consequences. It is the second most important risk factor for premature mortality, early deaths. And after smoking, we all know about smoking. Do we know about obesity? Do we know that overweight and obesity is just second to smoking in terms of reducing your lifespan? That's one thing we need to understand. So it's as serious as that. Oh, uh, even slight overweight increases the risk. And it's not only severely obese people who are at risk. So that's the second thing we need to understand. I am only here, but I am only few kilograms excess. Every kilogram excess of what is the desired weight adds that bit of risk in terms of health. So we need to focus on that as well. In terms of actual figures, nearly one in seven people, and this were figures from the World Diabetes Foundation in 2020, are obese or were obese. And this is likely to double in 2035. That means in 15 years, it's going to become one in four. That means 25% of the world's population is going to be obese or classified as overweight or obese. In fact, obese, not overweight and obese. And four billion, that means four times the figures in 2020, actually in 35 going to be overweight or obese. So if you add overweight to obesity, you have another two billion in the world. So it's a huge problem and it's an evolving problem and by the next decade or so there will hardly be anybody who has normal weight in terms of health risk. So, so we need to do something today, not only to ourselves but to the entire community and population. Childhood obesity is particularly you know, dangerous or particularly alarming and there is likely to be a hundred percent, that means a doubling of childhood obesity between 2020 and 2035. And this sets the tone for adult obesity, so it's more important. And it has several consequences, we'll discuss that a bit later. Uh, so in 2035, one in five children, that means this is, this is the pool from which adult obesity is going to come. And we need to focus our attention in childhood itself. Just look at the sites, you know, prevalence is going to increase by 100% in boys as far as childhood obesity is concerned by 125% in girls. In adult obesity there is going to be a 60% rise in the 15 years from 2020 to 2035. Males being particularly prone somehow, more males than females are going to become obese. And there is a huge economic burden for the country, health burden as we call it. So not only as an individual but as a community we need to focus attention on obesity mitigation um, methods and how to keep ourselves normal weight. How can this happen? The World Obesity Day, although it's in March, they focused and they said we should start having conversations with each other, with the community, the health workers with the community, increase the awareness about the health risks of obesity so that we all know that it's a problem. We all know that we need to um, rise and take action against it. And th this session, for example, is one such conversation that we'll be having, trying to engage with each other and learn about obesity and become more aware. Let's talk about the misconception about obesity and wealth. It used to be thought, as we all know, many of you might also believe, that obesity is a disease of, of the affluent. Only the rich people have it. Only the rich countries have it. If you see the right side panel on, on the slide, you will realize that obesity is fastest growing in low and middle income economies of the world these days. Nothing rich about it. Therefore, we are as much 
uh, to, to be affected by obesity as any other country and therefore we need to wake up. What about India? To see the left panel, latest estimates show that the high prevalence of abdominal obesity, I'll come to that a little later, when the obesity is confined or, or greatest around the abdomen, we call it abdominal obesity. This is particularly important as far as health risk is concerned. As well as generalized obesity, one fourth of the population, and mind you, this is rural, urban, everything put together across the nation. And this was a very recent figure, meaning close to 2020. One fourth of people overall, adults about 20, this is not children, are having abdominal obesity, which is the worst in terms of health risk. One fifth have generalized obesity in our country, India. High level of physical inactivity seen across the country. Urban, particularly more than the rural, women more than men. So we need to seriously think about our activity levels and about what we need to do about our weight. In Delhi, our own group found even higher. Delhi is not India alone. India is rural, urban, everything. But Delhi is an urban metro. Worst in terms of uh, unmasking of obesity. And therefore, overweight obesity was 80% in the adults. Can you beat that? Abdominal obesity, 73%. Slightly less than the overall obesity, but that included overweight. So anyway, the message is that nearly three-fourths of adults, which is alarming, I'm sure none of you would have imagined this is the same. This is confirmed by other studies in Delhi and metros. A very high percentage of Indians in the urban metros are obese or overweight. And therefore, they were huge health risk. That's why we are having all this diabetes, heart disease, all that. There is going to be a 5.2% annual increase in obesity rates in adults and this is obesity. That means severe obesity, not overweight, 30 BMI or more over the next 15 years. Childhood obesity is going to increase 10% every year, again high, huge economic costs as you said. These are figures, I just want, to, want you to know, we'll end about the figures right here. But just, I hope you've understood the magnitude of the problem we are dealing with. It's not, and, and we st still seem to believe it's just a matter of weight. Before we go to the rest of the uh, conversation, a little bit about childhood obesity. Because I, I mentioned that it is the most important thing, not only in terms of uh, the fact that it leads to adult obesity, if we don't take appropriate measures in time in childhood, but also it has a profound effect on the child's physical health, emotional health, and his economic academic performances in the school. Along with a very serious psychological impact because of his own self-esteem um, being affected, his peers putting pressure on him because of his weight and how he looks, and so on. So, so it's very important for us to stop childhood obesity. And therefore, we need to have this conversation in, in, um, with all seriousness. And the goal of these conversations are to change our perspectives about obesity and weight. All of us need to look at weight and obesity in a different way from what we've been looking at all along. To correct misconceptions about obesity, to end stigmas. The days of stigma on obesity are gone. We should now if 80% or if 75% of urban metros are overweight and obesity, where is the stigma? Stigma would be 5% five, five were having obesity and the remaining would say that you look at he is obese or he is overweight. So those days are gone. We need to take things seriously. Okay, so with that we start the conversation. The first thing I want, to, want you to really understand is what impacts weight. Again, we're not saying obesity, we're saying weight. Two or three of these factors, all of us are aware. For example, the, the, the diet, the activity level or physical activity, we all know that. This, this is what leads to excess diet and low physical activity leads to obesity. We also know genetics plays a part. Some of us who, who wish to blame everything on, 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 on our parents or our genetics, uh, for our weight, we 
would say everything is genetic, I can't do anything about it. Often people say that. What can I do? It's in my genes, my mother is obese, my, my father is obese and there's family history of obesity and overweight. What can I do about it? That is a factor of course, but we'll deal with it a little uh, later. How it impacts obesity and it's not all genetics, it's not all diet, it's not all physical activity. And it's not all lifestyle. Lifestyle is another thing which adds beyond diet and activity. But there are several other factors we also need to understand. Psychological factors, stress, medical conditions, which by themselves... The second question we need to ask ourselves, and after the background that I've given you over the last five, six minutes, uh, the answer would now obviously change. Is obesity a lifestyle choice? Or is it a disease? I'm sure none of us think of obesity as a disease, at least not as of now, or at least not till 15 minutes before, before now when I gave you all those figures. The myth is that obesity is a lifestyle choice. That means we can choose our lifestyle and we can choose to remain overweight or obese or normal weight. That's all there is to it. However, the fact is that obesity is actually a disease. Experts the world over are now realizing and clearly focusing on obesity as a disease. It's a chronic disease, just like diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, anything of that sort. It's not just cosmetic. And it is actually defined by WHO as a chronic, progressive, relapsing disease wherein an increase in body fat may affect health. May affect health. So it may not affect health, but it usually does affect health. So it's a disease. It's caused by a variety of factors, as we've already seen. But it's also caused by few, two or more factors which I want to focus and which is relevant to um, our efforts to maintain weight. Healthcare access, of course, and access to ultra-processed ultra food. These are additional factors which we'll come to just now and, and talk in a little more detail. Before that, the basic concept of energy. We need to understand that. How does obesity develop? Obesity is basically accumulation of fat in the body or increased fat in the body as we all know, excess body fat. It develops when energy intake is more, that is, that is you eat more and, and work less spend the less energy. A diet which provides more energy than can be uh, burnt away will cause obesity as you can see from this slide very clearly. You take 2600 calories, you, you spend 2600 calories and you maintain weight. If you, if you take 3500 but spend only 2600, even if you are spending 2600 you still will gain weight. And, and, and vice versa, if you, if you take, uh, spend more than you take, of course you lose weight. This is a fundamental concept which all of, us, all of us need to understand because this is the basis of maintaining our weight, this is the basis of our behavior which we should alter in order to keep to a particular weight. However, it's a little too simplistic, it's not as simple as this, but this is broadly the fundamental basis of weight regulation, how we need to keep our weight and how we need to reduce our weight. Everything will depend on this fundamental understanding. Now a little bit more about genetics. Did you know our genes count for somewhere between 40 to 70 percent of our likelihood to develop obesity? That means yes, people were not wrong when they said that genetics does play an important part in obesity. It's not as though if, if it's there in the genes we'll get it. It's not as, as simple as that or as direct as that. However, there is a 40 to 70 percent chance that you will you are predisposed to develop overweight or obesity and therefore you need to be extra careful. That is what it means. And when this genetic predisposition interacts with one of the other factors, for example, you take excess diet or you don't um, indulge in physical activity or you have other factors, and you already have a genetic predisposition to that extent, then you are likely to become overweight and obese. So that is the role of genetics. So if you are genetically predisposed, if there is obesity in the family, all the more reason 
instead of saying that I can't do anything, it's there in the family. A better approach would be, I need to be more alert. I need to be more aware. I need to be more aggressive in my activity and diet. Just look at the focus in the last um, bullet, environment that affects behavior. Others we've already touched. Easy access to high calorie food makes it harder to eat properly. That means you may want to eat. This is behavior. You know that you should not eat more. Excess calories will lead to overweight or obesity. Yet, the environment is so, you are surrounded by high energy, high calorie dense foods all around, but making it that much more difficult for you to refrain from taking them. And therefore, this behavior is an important contributor to obesity. We need to focus on that behavior as well. How to resist the temptation despite being surrounded by bad food choices. Portion distortion. As we all know, if you go to any restaurant these days or anywhere, the same serving, the serving size of the same item would have been half what it used to be earlier. For whatever marketing reason, you'll find a size which is doubled or maybe one and a half times or twice what it used to be a decade or two earlier. So when you order one of any item, you will get a bigger size, a bigger portion. And therefore, when you take the bigger portion, you tend to, when you get in the habit of taking such things, so the environment is, is working against you and this environment is artificially created by the market, by factors which are beyond our control and, 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 and by, uh, by, by the community and by the system, which we need to beat at the same time. In the morning, some of you had come to the workshop and somebody was saying this. It's a system. We need to correct the system at the same time that we need to talk about individual uh, approaches like decreased diet and increase activity. You need to provide proper methods or proper avenues for physical activity. Modern conveniences make it very less likely. You have lifts all, all, at all places. We have automobiles and cars everywhere. So who would want to walk? Who would want to climb the stairs? So that's a behavior which we need to change. This behavioral change is just as important as this focusing on take extra calories and you know exercise more. That 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 mantra is fine, but these behaviors which make us uh, increase in, our, um, in add weight need to be checked. So ultra processed foods are available cheaply everywhere. Again, people want to market the industry is uh, hell bent on selling its products and therefore. What can we do? So we need to change behavior. And therefore, the same balance which I showed you in the beginning, the, the both the negative and the positive side, the nutrition, and these I've added, sorry. I've added it below individual differences in genetics and behavior. So this interaction with your nutrition, physical activity is what determines weight. So we need to fo focus as much on your genetic predisposition as well as your individual behavior pattern in, in trying to regulate your weight as you focus on nutrition and physical activity per se. And to add to this sleep, how many of us know that if you do not have adequate sleep and adequate good quality sleep, we are likely to gain weight. And if you are trying to lose weight, it makes that much more difficult for us to lose weight. So everything else you may be doing right, but if you don't have a proper sleep pattern, it will work against your efforts. So we need to understand this as well. Now come to the next part. How do we measure obesity? How do I know whether I am overweight or obese and how do I need to keep a check? This is the index which we call, those who had come for the workshop in the morning, they would be more aware of this uh, figure and many of you might, be, might have heard about it as well. It's nothing but a measure which tries to relate your weight to your height. Because all of us know that the, the ideal weight is, is based on several factors but definitely is, is dependent on your height. The, the taller you are, the more elements of weight you 
you get. Therefore, there needs to be some equation, and this is an equation which which defines uh, weight to height. And based on this, and for Indians, this is what we look at. Because uh, I'll tell you why. This is the normal BMI. This is the I think all of us should do should get familiar with BMI. With that the step one because that's the measure and that's that's what will tell you how far you are from what is required. 18.5 to 22.9. Anything under 23, as far as the overweight is concerned, is good. It's normal. Once you cross 23, you become overweight. And if you cross 25, you will be called obese if you are an Indian. And if it's more than 30, it's severe obesity. Why is it that in Indians, you know, about 23, we start become being, being, being called overweight and why is it that in the West, you know, they wait till 25? How do they differ from us? How are we different? The reason is that, that for similar BMI, that means if, if somebody was, uh, let's say, weight 24 BMI, an Indian would have a lot of fat in his body compared to a European who will have that much less fat. That is that's again genetics. And therefore, all the bad health consequences that would occur in a European at 25 would start occurring in an Indian at 23 itself because we have more fat already inside. Some of our surgeon friends would, would, would watch for this that when, you do, when they do an abdominal operation, to reach the abdominal organs, they have to go through a lot of fat in Indians. And they don't look obese, mind you. They may not look. That's why it's important to have these measures. Sometimes we all believe that we are normal as far as weight is concerned. But when you actually start measuring and defining obesity as per this criteria, we realize that actually we are overweight. Some of, some of those who came in the morning were surprised <laughs> that they were overweight. They were being told they are overweight. You know, because they felt that I look fine. And I, I, I don't have that slide, but, but there, there's a famous slide of an Indian scientist, medical scientist, who looks apparently fine and thin and fit on the face of it, but uh, as compared to a European of the same BMI, but once you do his body fat estimations, you find that there's a huge difference. So let's not fool ourselves. People say don't judge the book by the cover, so don't, don't go by the looks all the time. Looks are good for attracting <laughs> girls, as Ashwini put it, but for health, we need to be clear and BMI is important. BMI, you said, but, but sometimes BMI can be fallacious, and particularly I told at the beginning that abdominal obesity, or if the fat is around the abdomen much more than the rest of the body, it's, it's more uh, harmful in terms of health consequence. And therefore, beyond a BMI or a height and weight measurement, it's the tape that helps us. And that's what we did in the morning as well. We measured the waist of every person, uh, uh, every individual who came for, for uh, obesity assessment or weight assessment because we felt we need to focus and tell them or let them know that this is far more important than just the BMI. Because if you measure it as he's measuring it, you get to know how much fat there is uh, around the abdomen and that's more serious and therefore we need to focus on that. And even a one centimeter decrease or increase in the waist, we all know our waist size, those, those who wear pants would know that, you know, difference in waist size very clearly tells you whether you're losing weight or gaining weight. But there's a standard method of measuring that waist with a specific inch tape. And that lets you know the waist and the higher the waist, and in Indians, if it's a, if, if, for men it's more than 90 centimeters, and for women it's more than 80 centimeters, then you have enough fat around the abdomen to put you at risk for health, uh, long-term health consequences. Okay, so with that background of what are the actions? So that much was awareness about weight, what causes weight, how do you measure weight and all that. Now what, what is the action? What should we do to regulate our weight? The easiest mantra that has been going around and all of us know this, eat less, move more. Yes, that is the crux or that is the cornerstone of all advice. However, there are several you know, nitty gritties in this which I hope we will cover in the next 20 minutes or so. 
those who came in the morning would also remember this. It's also there in the poster. Generally, I am not going into the you know, details of how each one of you have to, has to reduce your weight, but broadly, when we advise weight reduction in those who are overweight or obese, we aim for a 2 kilogram decrease over a month. We don't want very rapid weight loss and we don't want to make it very slow, but this is the usual weight loss that we aim for and for that all we need to do or, 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 or we need to begin with is a 500 calorie intake decrease from what you have been taking in the past either in form of dietary intake or supplemented with physical activity a negative balance of 500 kilocalories. How do you do that in terms of diet? Again broad principles we are not going into the details on integrities we all know that, but we need to practice these. When you find all these around you, then how, how do you resist the temptations? So, it's easy to say for me here, say no to preserved, packed, processed and canned food. All of them are calorie dense. No to cheese, mayonnaise. These are all processed cheese. I'm not talking of um, homemade cheese. Mayonnaise, jellies, candies, again, a lot of calories in them. Replace minor products of processed foods with multigrain cereal products which are shown to be beneficial. Say no to sugar and sweet products as is shown there. Broadly we tell you reduce one cereal exchange from each of your meals and that will along with a few other things that that will decrease the final calories from your diet. Broadly. Use less ghee and oil for cooking of course. Avoid fried food. Drink plenty of water and fluids. Have plenty of salads and have an early dinner. Broadly, these are, these are the principles or general principles of how to initiate your weight loss efforts. How it goes will depend on how you behave. In every individual behaves differently to this uh, standard of panacea that would give. So one says does not fit all. And therefore, having started with this, we need to monitor how you are doing with your weight and what we need to do and what adjustments we need to make at the end of the one month or two month period in order to optimize weight control. This is the broad <coughs> overview and of course this is, I brought, brought this slide only for you to realize you take 100 grams of any of these four food choices that are available look at the left two how many calories it gives you. Take 100 grams of these and look at the right two. So it's only 100 grams but if you take 100 grams of broccoli it gives you only 34 calories. 100 grams of candy bar will give you 400 calories. So what looks like a small candy bar, almost your breakfast is over. And therefore, we need to really focus on the food choices that we make. And this is summarized in this plate, which again was demonstrated in the morning uh, with, a, with a demo. It should be balanced in every way. The key thing is this line and the left half of this line. Usually it is this which fills more than 60% of our plate. We should have half of our plate broadly this is of vegetables and fruits. Any meal that we take. One fourth should be the cereals and then one fourth should be high protein foods. Some nuts could be there or other high protein foods. And of course, the drink of choice with meals should be water, preferably and not soda or carbonated drinks. At, they are all at two calories. So that was, and of course you need to follow healthy eating patterns, which I will not stress again. Now coming to the second component, move more. These are the general exercise recommendations. I think most of you would be aware of these recommendations. What I want you to focus on is this. The general recommendation of 150 minutes a week is good in terms of health benefits, not necessarily weight loss. So if you want weight loss, you require 250 minutes or more of moderate activity in a week, which is nearly double of what you do for health and fitness benefits. Which means if you walk 30 minutes, it should be close to 60 minutes. 
if you want weight loss, if that is your goal, which many people uh, do not are not aware. They think that I am doing good exercise as prescribed by my physician or doctor. Why am I not losing weight? The fact is, you need to double that activity to lose weight. Okay, so these are the various things. But what you want to do is list it down. Choose any activity which which makes you comfortable, which you enjoy, uh, and to which you are likely to stick as a lifelong routine. Because you can't afford to, you know, once you lose your weight, you can't afford to to abandon this. Then coming to the myths. If you understood this, then the myths that will follow will help you understand any degree of this. One common belief is that you know high volume and high intensity workouts in the gym are the only way to lose weight. Obviously, this is not true. It's a myth. It is propagated by those who run the gym and by the industry who wants the gym to succeed. Yes, you can lose weight by going to the gym, but that's not the only way. As I've told you, the, uh, clearly told you about uh, the energy balance, any form of activity, and there are posters to that effect. If you do any of these activities, even walking briskly for an hour, you can lose 300 to 400 calories. Cycling, swimming, dancing, all these are good enough. These are all outdoor activities and not in the gym. Many patients in our obesity clinic would say, especially the ladies, I do a lot of work at home, why do I need to exercise? Yes, it is true. You need to exercise for your health and fitness and so that you know you can lose a large amount of calories in a short period of time in a regulated manner. So exercise is important. However, all these activities at home would also contribute to weight loss and we should not ignore them. The only problem is, you know, if you, if, uh, for example, dusting 35 minutes just to lose 100 calories. Who's going to dust 35 minutes and lose 100 calories only? So these will all add. You may dust for 10 minutes. And such activities in cumulative will give you a good amount of calorie loss, but you need to supplement it with a regulated exercise. You can also do this. These are important habits. These are behavioral changes. All of us are very used to using mobile phones these days. But we tend to use them while we are sitting or, or lying down. Why don't we walk while we are talking? The whole day we are on the mobile. If you walk along with it, you start losing calories. Simple way of, losing your, of burning your calories. So these are some of the tips which you could use to, to increase your physical activity and regular weight. This I've already said, you can lose 400 calories just by walking for an hour and 10 minutes. The benefits of exercise go much beyond weight loss. All the other health benefits are mentioned on the slide. And so all, all of them you would gain, some of which even our chairperson mentioned in the beginning, apart from just losing weight. So sometimes by exercise, if you don't lose weight, don't dishearten, don't get disheartened. All the other benefits are accruing to you in any case. The only important thing about this slide is that let your efforts to losing weight be regulated, be under the supervision of somebody, maybe a, a healthcare worker, preferably a doctor, because it's a long term process, forcing, correcting, fine tuning, and, and your efforts will be optimized. And it's been shown that the, these interventions work are most successful when they're supported by the healthcare system. These are the risks which I mentioned in the beginning. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes and a number of cancers are more likely to occur if you're obese. So today we will not feel the pinch of cancer, we'll only look at the weight. I'm only 5 kilograms excess or 10 kilograms excess, but in the long run, you are subjecting yourself to that extra risk of not only diabetes and heart disease but also cancers. And there is a list of 14-15 cancers which can occur in obese as compared to a normal person. So we need to be careful and we need to awaken, awaken ourselves. All the risks other than cancers and diabetes are also mentioned. Many people have osteoarthritis these days, knees, knee replacements, gallbladder disease and so many other uh, things. The entire list would be huge. Coming to the other myths, a large amount of weight reduction is required because this puts off an individual, let's say who is let's say 80, 90 kilograms, he says my ideal weight is close to 55, 60, how can I lose 40 kilograms? 
and nothing going to benefit me unless I lose 40 kilograms. This is wrong. It's a myth. You don't need to lose 40 kilograms to get the benefit regarding health risk. Even 2.5% weight reduction will give you some benefit. 5% will give you some more benefits. And 10% weight loss will give you benefits in terms of prevention of cardiometabolic risk. That means diabetes, heart disease and so on. So it's not as if all the 40 kilograms have to go away, go right away and you get back to the ideal weight straight away. No, please don't get disheartened. Have smaller goals. And as you achieve them, you, you, you raise the bar and then go towards the ideal weight in the long term. Therefore, obesity is not just about weight, it is about overall health. Let us understand that as well. It's not just weight. Although it is a measure of weight or it's a, it's a state of uh, overweight, that's correct. But managing obesity or managing weight is not just weight increase or decrease. All that you do to mitigate the risk because of that excess weight is equally important. Weight reduction is difficult. Maintaining weight reduction is easy once I lose weight. Many people say that, you know, if I could just get that weight off, I could keep it off. Again, this is a myth. That means the most difficult thing is for me to lose my, lose whatever excess weight I have. Somebody help me do that and then I'll remain fit for the rest of my life. That seems to be a, uh, it's a common concept, but that's wrong. It's a myth again. Most experience suggests it's, it's, more easy or more successful to lose weight if you follow the regime that's been explained but it is far more difficult to sustain this weight maintenance uh, this weight loss because you tend to regain the weight that you've lost and this is because partly because of biology there is body has an inherent mechanism you know once you start losing weight it progressively tries to oppose your efforts to lose weight. As we all know, they, they, anyone who has tried losing weight would realize this. That's because body is trained to or, or, or um, programmed to avoid starvation. And therefore, as you start losing, will the signals go inside to make you, you know, to restore your original weight. And therefore, it's far more difficult. That's part of the reason. Part of the reason is the other reasons like this, there's a cycle of dieting. As we all know, again, this is behavior. You start a diet very enthusiastically. Initially, there's a lot of motivation. Once there are positive results, afterward, the gradually your motivation tends to drop because you seem to have achieved some success. Then you, your compliance goes down. Usual cycle. You start you relaxing. Then you fail. Then you blame yourself, then you say nothing can happen, and you start going back to your original habits, start regaining weight. This cycle goes on and on. And we've all been through this cycle, those who have attempted weight loss. So we need to, at this stage probably, we need to have a support. At this stage we need to have a support to reinforce the fact that it's, it's, it's uh, one need to continue with your measures, otherwise you'll regain weight. What is harmful about regaining weight is that weight that you regain tends to be more around the abdomen and tends to be more harmful than your original weight. Mm -hmm. So this cycle is even more harmful. So please, whatever measures anybody might take, try to make it a lifelong habit. Now this is another myth. In fact, in the morning itself somebody was mentioning this. this everybody believes that you take more protein, of course it will build muscle. But also you, you will lose weight. It's not as simple as that. So we need to understand that as well. Yes, if you take regulated protein all through the day in different times and distributions, it helps. Because protein foods are more, are, are supposed to induce satiety better. You feel full and you would tend not to eat more. However, proteins also have same calories as carbohydrates and no protein is just protein every protein containing food also has carbohydrates or fat so just by thinking that i'll be able to reduce weight by taking protein is not by itself correct yes the proportion of protein in your diet should be more 
as compared to the proportion of carbohydrates and fats. That is correct. But just by taking more and more protein, you don't reduce weight. Here are so many proteins, with high protein foods mentioned in this panel. Many of them have a lot of fat as well. And you can see there are a lot of calories in all these so-called protein rich foods. So while they are good, while the, there should be more uh, portions of these proteins in your diet, as I indicated, 25% of your diet should contain proteins. Doesn't mean that you go on taking proteins and that will reduce weight. If you take it beyond the, the specified amount, you will still have more calories. Reduce calories as much as possible during the day and have some room for later. That means, this is again a myth or this is a common belief. Don't take anything in the morning, don't take anything at lunch. Skip those two meals and then by evening you can take the calories, whatever is mentioned or whatever you require to take and you lose weight. Easy way of losing weight. This is a common belief. That means this is what I was mentioning. But if you see carefully, when you reach here, what happens? You start craving for food. If you had missed your lunch or you had a mild small lunch and you were starving till you reached home and you didn't have breakfast or very low uh, energy breakfast. By the time you reach in the evening, you crave for food. And that's when you eat everything at sight and then heavy dinner. Then you get upset that you've eaten more. You don't get hungry in the morning. The cycle repeats. You have to break this cycle. You must have all your meals. You reduce the quantity of each meal but don't skip meals. This is the usual advice. A small percentage of patients of course have the opposite to be advised. If they take unhealthy breakfasts, it's better not to have the breakfast than have an unhealthy breakfast. But by and large, this is the uh, thing that you need to know. We will not spend too much time on this, but sugar. Sugar does not cause diabetes by itself. Carbohydrate or excess calories ultimately can result in diabetes after causing obesity. So it's not as though you should avoid food, uh, sugars if you are not a diabetic. Moderate added sugar intake can still be part of healthy diet. So let's be clear on this as well. It's not necessary to avoid all sugar. Supplements. In the West, it's a billion dollar industry. Even here, the number of food supplements are there. People claim you take these supplements, you lose weight. Minimal evidence, both of safety and efficacy. So I will never advise anybody to depend on supplements to reduce weight. Fat diets. Again, these are, there are a number of problems with fat diets. Many people tend to be attracted by fat diets, but keep these things in mind. What you need to do is a calculated caloric uh, intake which is low and not over dependence on fats. I deliberately put this slide for the audience because I am sure uh, many of you would have been told many times in your uh, interactions with some physicians or even other healthcare workers that if you have gained weight or if you have a lot of obesity you must be having a thyroid problem. And there, I, there was a session last month, I believe, on thyroid disorders. Maybe it was covered there as well. This is a common belief. I mean, we all tend to think that we are obese and therefore we have, we, have, we have excess weight and we must be having a thyroid, some hormonal problem, particularly blame the thyroid. Yes, thyroid function is frequently assessed in patients with obesity with the hope to identify a cause of obesity. Not wrong. However, Weight gain is a frequent complaint in abdomen, but is usually of a very limited extent, which we need to understand. Treatment of hypothyroidism produces only modest weight loss, less than 10%. Severe obesity is usually not due to hypothyroidism. So if we know these facts, in large majority of cases who believe that their excess weight is all due to a thyroid disorder, more often than not, it is otherwise. And even if thy uh, thyroid disease is contributing, the contribution is minimal or, 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 or a very small percentage of the entire weight. Therefore, the other corollary of what I am saying is that while you need to control your uh, thyroid problem if it exists, you, can, you have to continue to indulge in weight loss efforts, only then your weight will come back to normal. Don't assume that everything is um, due to the thyroid problem. So that's 
put, that's the only reason why I put this slide. I think, if I'm not correct, this should be the last slide. So I think in the last half an hour, 35 minutes, what I've tried to do is, you know, initially tell you about the problem, then to tell you or, or recapitulate what we need generally advise uh, as a physician or as a nutritionist or as a, uh, an educator, what you need to do to reduce your weight. But then what are the myths in this practice, in these actions that you might want to take? What are the limitations? What are the complications? What else you need to keep in mind so that you, you are more successful in your efforts to decrease or regulate your weight? Uh, I hope you have uh, you have understood the basis of the weight and, and what you need to do and how you need to spread this message across to others and I'm open to questions <coughs> and others. Thank you. Uh, walk around 45 to 60 minutes. It should be in one stretch or in a day? Okay, that's a good question. Uh, the one stretch thing is mainly for cardiac fitness. So if you walk about let's say 15, 20 minutes, at a stretch, that helps your fitness. But as far as weight loss is concerned, or even even for fitness, they say that you break it into two, it doesn't matter. And particularly for weight loss, it need not be in one session. The total uh, walk or could be of that duration an hour a day. In a day, in a day, a total of 250 minutes a week, even if it's not the same each day. The other. And yours has been one of the best presentations now, and I remember way back in November 2021 as well. Thank you. Uh, coming to the calorie la loss part, of course, the exercises were explained, whether it is walking or cycling or any other form of exercise. Can there be any utility of yoga or yoga related exercises towards losing calories? Yoga is not an exercise. Let's understand that. Yoga, we generally don't refer to yoga as exercises, we refer to yoga as yoga postures. Okay. As we are, as we are yes. all aware. And therefore, the, the postures are more for regulation of internal phenomenon, not necessarily loss of calories. You will lose calories even if you sit or stand and maintain a particular posture. But it is nothing compared to what you lose in moderate activity in an exercise. So if it's only with the goal of calorie restriction, yoga is not useful. However, yoga has been found to, to affect obesity in different ways because I told you psychological stress, so many other factors affect weight and indirectly yoga does contribute to decrease, decrease in weight but not through calorie burning alone or not through that as the main mechanism. Is there a possibility through indirectly speeding up the metab metabolism of the body through the yoga postures? Yes, there are a lot of claims. I would not be the right person to, to, to tell no. you that whether it actually does so or not. There are a lot of studies that are going on. Um, yoga experts do claim that you know it can speed up the body metabolism and that's an indirect way by which you know the weight loss occurs. Yes, we did we have been doing studies on yoga for prevention of diabetes and it does work from our whatever we have seen, but not necessarily through weight loss. Another aspect, you know. young children, even my children these days, they hit the gym to be fit. And then comes the request that can we have the protein supplements? How safe could they be or should there be a strict no to it? Okay, that's a very... Uh, so that is the idea. From the food itself. Food itself. But that requires careful planning. about it or they understood better. I think that our tariqa is right.